Greetings. Okay, let's test the mic front, side, side. Okay. I think that's going to work. Okay. Okay. So in the back, or if there's any um, kind of not being able to hear, just, you know, do something. I'll try to see you. It's hard with this really bright lights in my eyes. <laughs> so um, I want to first thank um, the Naropa University and um, the Lentz Foundation for the invitation um, to come and be here and to speak. Um, I thank all of you for um, having come to the many talks and keep coming. And um, that it makes me feel good and very encouraging in that way. That's what I'm saying, very encouraging. I, I don't mean feel good like I'm all that, but feel good that it's very encouraging that maybe some of the things that I share or are sharing will um, benefit not only um, uh, you, but your, your family and your community. And um, this is my hope that it spreads and that everyone walked in here today with uh, their ancestors. <laughs> and um, Thich Nhat Hanh always say, said that when you are practicing and you go to a retreat or any place you go, or if you just come to school, everywhere you go, you are bringing your family, community, and ancestors with you. So maybe they're not in the room with you. Maybe they don't know what you do when you're in certain places, but you know, they're, they're with you. you know? um, when I used to go to school a lot, when I was studying in college, I would often feel my mother you know, sitting there. And um, that's because I knew she would have wanted to have a university experience. And she couldn't. You know, she just didn't have the education for that. And, um, I think uh, she went all the way to uh, sixth grade elementary school, um, but she was still older. She was older when she was getting to sixth grade. She was an adult. And when she graduated from uh, high school, uh, she was my age, pretty much. And um, it was very profound because she graduated high school. My older sister and I graduated from undergraduate and all three of us together. And it was really um, a wonderful year. So I think she's here today, too, because she would have loved to have been here, sitting right there, maybe, or right there. And um, you know, just wanting to be in the atmosphere of learning and the atmosphere of uh, inquiry and um, dialogue, because we had a lot of dialogues. And, um, even though she, she wasn't educated in a traditional sense, she was educated in life <laughs> and uh, was interested in it. Um, I believe my father was too, and, um, but this kind of environment would have been intimidating for him as a person who was illiterate uh, all of his life. And um, when he, uh, I think I spoke in one group about him speaking Creole and people thinking he was uh, retarded or something because he was a black man born in America that couldn't speak English. But he had a second language, and uh, it was Creole. And he spoke that very you know, beautifully, brilliantly. And you could see this whole other man you know, in, in the way that he taught. But he was intimidated by the educational system a lot um, because his um, experience of life was being, uh, you know, a sharecropper, you know, and um, in rural Louisiana, and um, you know, running barefoot and working hard, and um, so I remember him showing up, wanting to come to my graduation at UCLA, and um, I was like, "You want to come to my graduation?" And he says, "Yes, I'm coming." And he gets puts on his suit, and he really could dress, boy. He's he's dapper, dapper. I think I learned how to do some of the dressing by him, because my mother really didn't care. 
but he really cared. And he had all these suits, like powder blue suits, and you know, really the shoes were shine. I mean, he was all the time, hat, you know, his hats and things. So he had gotten dressed up, you know, to come to the graduation. And UCLA is like gigantic. And I was like, wow, why would he come to this graduation? You know, because he never came to not one of them. Not elementary school, junior high, not even high school. And, but he was coming to this one. And I have pictures of it. So yeah, he's in his blue suit, <laughs> powder blue suit. And I, I was like, wow, this is amazing. And he came, and I knew he, something was pushing him forward to see his uh, daughter in, in a place that he didn't understand, didn't know what it was, didn't even know why I was there, what I studied, or anything. But he wanted to see, and I said, oh, man, he must be getting ready to die. You know, I was like, this is, this is profound. And uh, I think he did die soon after, but I don't know how soon, maybe like six years later, five or six years later. And, um, but I, I'll never forget it. Like, what, what did it take for someone like him that had a lived experience that had nothing to do with institutions? I mean, he barely, um, come, going to church was major. Because we had a huge church, like three, ten times this. And he um, loved Sunday school, but he couldn't read. And so on Saturday night, I would take out, um, he would take out his little Sunday school book. You have these books you get in um, Christian churches. <laughs> Everyone has these books, not just the Bible. You have these study books to help you study the Bible. And we would sit together on Saturday night, and just he and I, and I would read him the lesson, you know, like that. And then he would make a symbol on the page for the words. So when he got to Sunday school, he would just pretend he was reading. <laughs> and he would read out loud that lesson. And I, and I was like, one of these days, this is not going to work. <laughs> you know? I would always be afraid for him, like, oh, no. But evidently, he either made it through, or he didn't, or they knew, or something. But I think if they had just given him a chance, you know, to be the man that he was. They would, have, they would have been blown away about what he had to teach and what he um, wanted to share with them about life. And uh, so he was never, because he had this tongue, thick Creole tongue, never allowed to lead prayer in church and these kinds of things. And so uh, I decided to shed my love on him. And uh, I understood something through him by how he continued to live his life, no matter all of this disregard, not only because he was black, but because he was illiterate. Uh, he couldn't speak the language. He couldn't read street signs. He only knew landmarks. So Lord help him if a building was torn down or something. But he didn't. That's how he navigated. And so um, I, I understand, to me, and the way I, I feel like is that the lived experience, like his lived experience, um, was a gateway to, for him to a freedom in a, in a world that basically he was not a part of. He, he really wasn't, you know, in that everyday sense that we all are. You know, he didn't go grocery shopping. He could not read nothing. He could go and get meat, you know, because he knew meat. You know, he could go buy that. He was a great cook, you know. I, I do have his gumbo recipe. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so, and he, because he taught me that. And um, I do talk about that in my latest book, uh, The Deepest Peace. I talk about it as a transmission. So of his, um, his, of who he was. So the topic tonight is the lived experience as the gateway to freedom. And um, because oftentimes um, we leave our lives outside the door 
to come into a place we think is spiritual. You know, like, I don't know where people think spirit is. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as, as life went through and especially in um, my world I began to see on, on the spiritual path that um, many spiritual paths had these ideas about um, the body and ideas about our lives and that um, mostly even in, in the church I would notice that our lives and our embodiments and how we were as people as human beings that this embodiment and humanness was in the way that it wasn't the best thing you know that you can sin in it <laughs> You know, and um, or you, you know, it was not the best. It was, it was. Um, how do you live away from this uh, tendency as human beings to do wrong, think wrong, say wrong, you know, everything wrong? And I learned that early on in the Christian church. You know, you know the sin, and people would get up constantly and uh, repent. What they call repentance or their sins. Um, I love church, so I just want to put that up there. And I, I stayed in church through my entire adulthood because my goal was to um, change how church and transform, how, how uh, Christ's teachings were uh, you know, presented. So I didn't get a chance to do that, so I had to make it up when I got to the Buddha Center. But anyway, you know, to change a little bit of how, you know, look, I would listen to the preacher and I'd go, now let me, I could talk about that a little bit better. I could feel it, you know. Um, but I think I felt that um, all, everything of who I was was wrong before I even knew who I was. So that imposition, you know, that everything I did was a sin um, was very oppressive, you know, in a lot of ways. So... Um, but at the same time, being in community with the church, like a tribe, was wonderful, you know, to sing and to be with people who knew me before I was born and who knew me grow into an adulthood. You know, I've never had that. I don't have that. You know, who knew me as earthling, like we was talking about earlier. They really knew me. So the other thing, if the, if the body is, is not right, then we need to overcome the human condition. We got to overcome all of this. So then you get baptized or you do something. You got to change it to get over it. I want to improve myself. I got to be better. And my personality's got to, everything's got to change. Even how I look has got to change because I don't look right. I don't feel right. I'm not talking right. I don't act right. And all of these things are, um, imposed upon us, what's right and what isn't. So when you're on the spiritual path, even though these things are imposed from the outside world, we bring them into our sanctuaries, into our path, sometimes into our uh, spirituality. We think we're not bringing it until maybe something happens. You can be in a perfect spiritual sanctuary and community, and they'll say, okay, we're going to choose some people, not you. And then, you know, and you're like, you're like well, wait a minute. <laughs> Something's wrong with me, so I better learn how to do this better, you know. Maybe I should carry the incense more here, you know. Maybe I'm not walking right or something. You know, you find something, you know, or maybe at something, maybe this, maybe that. But anyway, um, then you start falling into this whole emotional uh, path, <laughs> you know, uh, while you're on, this, on the path of spirit. And, um, and the emotions, um, they'll say, oh, no, don't, don't, don't cry now, don't. Get angry. Don't don't have emotions because you're 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 not mature if you show your emotions now, and and then um, it's just a distraction. It's a distraction from the Buddhist teachings. It's a distraction from God. It's distract. You you got to pull yourself up somewhere so that you're not down there, you know. So then that becomes a problem, you know. Then you have to like work at that. And this is all about being in the body, right? We have emotions. We have emotions. No matter what they do and how they're expressed and what happens, we have them. So then we go to how can we fix this life? 
Okay, you keep, I gotta fix the emotions. I gotta fix the wrongs. And we, um, and we try to fix it by uh, who we have in our lives, uh, where we go, is everything on the outside. Uh, what we do, you know, it, it, these things hopefully will fix how we are. And then, um, if all else fail, just leave the messy life outside. You know, just outside the door. So when you come in, you're very quiet, you don't let anybody know anything about what's going on with you. Dare not go into a discussion with any spiritual teacher because then they might find out, oh my God, they are in fact insane and crazy. Yeah. So they got, <laughs> you know. So, you know, when I wrote The Way of Tenderness, I was very aware that it was important uh, to bring the message that, that um, what we've been given and what we've been given and what we all inherited was life. And so it, it's important that we take in and embrace what we were given. We all inherited life, you know. I'll call that the uh, mindfulness bill. <laughs> So while I talk about um, race, sexuality, and gender as gateways, it could be any embi embodiment, just embodiment, and that the lives we have are not to be tossed away, rearranged, polished up, whatever we do, cook it more, you know, <laughs> cook it less. You know, all of these things we do with life is not it. All the things that are coming to us are the things we are to go through, and hopefully in the passage of life that we come to some understanding, or not even an understanding, we come to an experience of what freedom might be. So I'm gonna read this one, I think this one paragraph in the way of tenderness is uh, important. Race, sexuality, and gender are said to be illusions without reality, and yet we feel their presence and hear their footsteps like invisible monster, monsters coming at us. So I, that, just to say, like, it's, it's an illusion. I said, well, then what's wrong with you when I show up? Mm -hmm. Or somebody else shows up, and there's a, mm -mm, a flicker in your body. I mean, it happens to me, too. You know, when somebody shows up, I have a flicker. So it's an illusion, but it's still a relative experience because we're embodied. And to acknowledge it and not push it away. To, and, you know, some people just don't get, they're not around people at all, so they, so they don't have the flicker. Whatever. They don't have a heart attack, you know, but some presence of life they can't deal with. And so race, sexuality, and, and gender are said to be illusions without reality, and yet we feel their presence and hear their footsteps like invisible monsters coming at us. But there are no monsters, no. If we do not anchor our inquiry into life, with the undeniable physical reality in which we live, spiritual awakening will remain far too abstract. It's just like that. And then we begin to not understand the teachings. If we do not anchor our inquiry into life within the undeniable physical reality in which we live, spiritual awakening will remain far too abstract. So when we hear people talking about uh, spirituality or awakening, we're going, sounds interesting. But if we were to repeat it or to talk about it in our own experience, it would become difficult, you know, because it's not grounded in this, the life that we live and the life we've been given and the things that come to us in our lives. If we explore and engage our various embodiments by coming to an understanding of them as paths to spiritual transformation, we would understand life, our very living, as the gateway to freedom. It could be the gateway to even not freedom, wherever you're going. I don't know where you think you might be going. <laughs> but we're talking freedom today and that, that freedom comes through life. Buddha, um, when he was uh, in the starving condition, and there are a few statues you know, that kind of show that about his life, where he's just all bones. But you never see that statue in anybody's center, you know, or Buddha. Because <laughs> it's just very like, whew, 
and he's just all bones. And he, um, he had practice, you know, in various ways to live in the forest on very, a little bit of food and not a lot. They say a grain of rice as a symbol, I think, was just saying he ate very little. And um, he realized as he was dying from not eating that he needed his body in order to experience enlightenment. He needed an experience you know, of enlightenment. And he didn't know what death would bring. So um, he ended his quest. I call it the vision quest. <laughs> he ended it. And um, the people he brought with him, some of his um, friends or disciples or whoever they were, they were very upset because they were like, well, wait a minute. We're supposed to be out here in the forest until we get the enlightenment and da 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 and then so he said, well, I have the teachings. I, I got it. And, and they said, well, what's the teaching? He says, I am the awakened one. And they were like, um, this is, <laughs> sounds, they weren't going for that. And so then he, you know, then he changed it to what he had dreamed. Because he had four dreams, and he was a lucid dreamer. He changed it to there is suffering. And that he, you know, he was trying to tell him he was awakened to life, but but you know it was hard for them to understand that because it wasn't um, based in the lived experience he had even in the forest. So he had to come back and say, "What based on my life, I suffered out here. <laughs> there is suffering." Then when he said that and all the other noble truths, then it was understood because it was based in the lived experience. So when I talk about freedom, so freedom means many things to many people, right? Depending on the person, you could be a freedom as an activist. Um, there's um, freedom to particular groups, like people talk, I want to be free from this. And so I remember um, even hearing the word liberation in the Dharma when I first heard it. And I said, wow, they're talking about liberation like we were talking about way back in yeah, 1970 or so. You know, so it's like, wow, they're talking about liberation? And I really was thinking it was about the same kind of liberation. I said, hey, you know, solidarity. And, uh, you know, I realized, no, they're not talking about that. Mm. And then I realized I needed to learn something like about liberation and about freedom that was different than what I knew and what I understood from my lived experience, right? And so um, I began to study on the path of Dharma. And then on that path, uh, I understood freedom as um, knowing, I would say knowing and having the wisdom that we live in relationship with one another in accordance with principles that do not cause suffering to self and others and that there are specific prescriptions on the path. Like, you don't have to like figure it out in a, in a dharma. They just say, this is how you live a life of freedom. And that's through the precepts, or the Eightfold Paths, or all these different ways that is, is listed and very clear. And I said, no, they're really not talking about that liberation and freedom I came in the door with. And I began to study that. But in studying that, um, I realized there is, uh, as I practice it, I could let go of all the dogma of the Dharma even. And I get free of that. <laughs> and then there is a freedom that is free. And I talked about that a little bit. I said, there's a freedom that is even free. So that you're not free, getting freedom from something and to get to something. And it's a freedom um, that is not a thing, that uh, freedom from a thing or a person or even a country, but freedom within one's life experience. Like within your experience, you can experience freedom. Like right now, in this moment. Like in the moment. Without the dogma. Even if you don't even know what it is, you can invite it until it shows itself. If you're willing to wait and be patient for it to show itself. And when it shows itself to go, no, I don't want to be that free. <laughs> I think I remember the first time I said, I think I need all of my illusions. I <laughs> Life is tough. So the, free, the uh, freedom that is free is open so that you can create the life you envision for yourself. You know, it's just open. And, it, and I invite you not to even define it. 
That's why I say freedom that is free. I invite you to walk with it and live it and see what that is, or what it looks like, and our feel into when you feel it might not be happening. You know, um, so, and, and, or then again, you can go through the steps of, of the Buddhist path or many other paths there are to do. So I wanted to share with you from a book that I love. Sorry for all the electronics that they've all been blessed by the Dalai Lama. <laughs> <laughs> So, so this is a book called uh, um, This Thing Called You um, by Ernest Holmes. Uh, many, some of you may know him. Born in 1887, I think he died in 1960, and he was um, one of uh, what they would call a new thought minister, you know, at the time, and a writer and uh, recognized as an authority on religious psychology and the founder of the um, Religious Science and the Mind Movement. And um, I saw this book, the title, This Thing Called You. I said, oh, that's, that's for me. And I took this book off the shelf many, many, many years ago. And it's like this small, it's about 116 pages, and I've been reading it for 30 years, the same pages. So I'm gonna read it to you because it was so profound, I can't keep going. You know, I have flipped through some of it, but it just, it just doesn't come through. So I thought, it, I, I love what he says about living. It's just powerful. You, like all others, are seeking the joy of living. You wish to be needed, to be loved, to be included in the great drama of life. This urge is in every individual. It is in everything. The rose exists to express beauty. Root and branch conspire with nature to give birth to blossom. An artist will starve in his garret that he may chisel an angelic form from a slab of marble, compelling the unyielding substance to accept the breath of creation. Not only human beings, but everything in nature is endowed with this creative urge. When moisture is precipitated, the desert receives it with gladness and breaks forth into a song of creation. Making the most of its brief season, it blossoms in joy, storing within its bosom the seed of a future flowering. It is impossible to escape this creative urge. Everything must find fulfillment or perish. And so he goes on to talk about that we must create or perish, that we are all in this life looking for joy and fulfillment, but through creation. So if you think you are not an artist, think again. You are an artist. And art doesn't always just hang on the wall. Yeah, it, it's your life. So is art not an expression of someone else's life? And then we would relate to it when we see it or not. This is not my life. You know, I don't, you know, John Basquiat, I no, no, no. You know, and somebody, you know, people, not my life, you know. So it, but your life is being, is in an artistic process. And in that living, there's an experience, and in that, uh, we are free to do this creation. And I, I see that as a freedom that he's talking about, that we are free to create a kind of living that is sane, despite oppressive conditions, and in an inner peace, despite the chaos of the world around us. We must be artists. And people do is talk about being um, art activists. You know, artivists. That's, I love that new term a lot of people are using. So I also like to share briefly um, from um, Zen master Dogen Zenji, uh, founder of Soto Zen, um, something he said that was actually shared by uh, Shahaku Okamura, who was uh, Roshi, who's a Zen master I love to study with all the time and sit with him. And he was just always blowing my mind, like you know the way he would describe Zen. And I think he had a lot to do with me freeing up what Zen was. You know, and, and to be free 
within how I practice. Um, that doesn't mean I just did what I want. I just it meant that what I saw and how I experienced it, um, I was free and open to take it in in, in the way that I needed to um, and to hear it and, and chew on it and, um, and digest it in my own time, in my own way, based on my own lived experience. So a lot of times in Buddhism, they think, oh yeah, nobody's talking about you know, your physical life. But Dogen talked a lot about the physical life. And um, he also, I was telling some other folks that he talked about thinking that we must think. There's a useful purpose to it. You know, so a lot of times you know, we, we mix up some other uh, teachings with Buddhism. Because there is some teachings, maybe they're East Indian, they're ancient. It could be we really mix up the Vedic teachings, the Vedanta teachings with Buddhism. And in there, there's different. You know, you, you try not, you know, you work on thinking and you, you move it away. You know, but Dogen was like, you have it right in front of you. And he also believed in um, uh, loving this physical life. And he talked a lot about the physicality of life, and so did the Buddha. Many, many discourses on the body. And, and tissue, right down to tissue and blood and bones. So this is uh, definitely derived from Buddha. And he says, um, we must bring to realization the road on which the self encounters the self. These words should be engraved on skin, flesh, bones, and marrow. That's directly from the Buddha. Engraved on the interior and exterior of body and mind. Engraved on emptiness and on form. They are engraved on trees and rocks, engraved on fields and villages. We say that mountains belong to the country. Actually, they belong to those who love them. You know, so actually, the mountains belong to those who love them. He was a poet, you know, and um, many Zen masters were. So he is trying to get us to love the uh, physical life and things that are physical. And I thought to read about the mountains since we're sitting so close <laughs> to them. I've just been loving it. <laughs> so, um, so now I'm going to move into a few, uh, maybe a little more fun, maybe not. But uh, I wanted to share with you, and I'm sharing this um, for uh, you know Cynthia, who has been taking us all around and helping us a lot, and um, to all of those who've been um, making this environment uh, so welcoming, working hard to do that. And I haven't shared this before, and it's from my upcoming novel. And in the story, the, the young girl has a lived experience of having a, a connection and um, sort of like a possession with water, and has had an experience, a lived experience with water that uh, changes how she looks at life and how um, she finds freedom even in a despair. She lives in Haiti, and um, she's living in the middle of a coup, one of the first coups in Haiti in 1915. And she's at her aunt's house after having gone through a whole lot before she gets to her aunt's house in Port-au-Prince. And so at first she's living in a village, um, and then they're, they're forced from that village um, by fire. So anyway, she's at her aunt's house, and she's sitting there talking with her. So Aunt Flay cut the radio off. She beckoned me from the floor to sit next to her on the sofa. Well, life can be hard, baby, she said repeatedly. She must have been talking about the everyday life of being a Haitian. All the grown folks, especially Papa, talked about bad about Haiti. Haiti. To avoid going down a tunnel of horror while she talked. I imagined things that made life soft, like flan that was crunchy on the edges, cocoa that was creamy and sugary. Each time Flay said the word hard, I thought of what was good, because hard to her equaled black skin, black life, black trouble, black fate. I wasn't ever going to be white. Therefore, I was not willing to decide that my whole life would be dismal because I was black. Being black was hard, but not that kind of hard. It was only, if only she saw that being hard was to be 
unbreakable. If we jumped ship as slaves and survived, we were built to resist. We were constructed to revolt, to fight back against everything wrong. We were meant to defy death, to protest, make things as good as sweet potato pudding. We survived because we were vigilant. We looked ageless because we were not that kind of hard that was bitter and bleak. Our black was the sea moving beneath our skin. And that's her idea that she has this thing about. She has sea creatures in her life. <laughs> So I wanted to read one more of my favorite things and, um, because I'm really, as you see, enforcing <laughs> an ideology, I guess, but not really. I just want to invite us to open up to being, which is what I learned, to be liberated no matter what, you know, no matter who I am, no matter how I'm um, approached or not approached. Um, I talked earlier about no one sits next to me on the bus you know, or tra any public transportation, to still be able to um, know that I, 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 my life in this space that I live in, in right here, is um, of value. And even, even the pain that may come from that is of value to me, because it lets me see. And as I was practicing that kind of pain that would come to my heart when things like that would happen, you know, they pass the seat on the bus, that, that kind of pain would be so hard. Sometimes I would go to work and I'd be in tears. And they were like, what's wrong with you? Well, how can I tell them I was on the bus and nobody sat next to me? I'm both, you know, <laughs> and I'm one of the supervisors or something. So I, so I, I really, as I practiced, I, be, I didn't stop, want to stop that. Like, I'm going to get over that. I walked and walked and walked into practice until when that happens, it doesn't feel the same now. There may be a feeling of, oh, but it's really old. I remember feeling bad and crying about it. But it's not, it doesn't take me out. My suffering doesn't take me out of my life. It doesn't take me out of life. It gives my life out of life. I remain connected to everybody and everything despite the ignorance that exists. It just exists as what is being given to us as our life experience. And then there's places where I am also that. You know, so um, trying to watch the time here. I think I'd like to read one more. And then I, I'm going to give you some homework <laughs> since we're in the college. <laughs> so i sorry. I give my students homework, too, in the Zendo. <laughs> this is your homework. So in, this is from Toni Morrison, beloved from the late Toni Morrison, and freedom to love despite the horror. She's a good Dharma teacher. In this here place, we flesh, flesh that weeps, laughs, flesh that dances on bare feet in grass. Love it. Love it hard. Yonder, they do not love your flesh. They despise it. They don't love your eyes. They just as soon pick them out. No more do they love the skin on your back. Yonder, they flay it. And oh, my people, they do not love your hands. Those they only use, tie, bind, chop off, and leave empty. Love your hands. Anyway, love them. Raise them up and kiss them. Touch others with them. Pat them together. Stroke them on your face. Because they don't love that either. You got to love it. You got to love it. And know they ain't in love with your mouth. Yonder out there, they will see it broken and break it again. What you say out of it, they will not heed. What you scream from if they do not hear. What you put into it to nourish your body, 
they will snatch away and give you leavings instead. No, they don't love your mouth. You got to love it. This is flesh I'm talking about here. Flesh that needs to be loved. Feet that need to rest and to dance. Backs that need support. Shoulders that need arms, strong arms. I'm telling you. And oh, my people out yonder, hear me. They do not love your neck unnoosed and straight. So love your neck. Put a hand on it. Brace it. Stroke it. Hold it up. And all your inside parts that they just as soon slot for hogs, you got to love them. The dark, dark liver. Love it. <laughs> love it. And the beat and beating heart. Love that too. More than eyes or feet. More than lungs that have yet to draw free air. More than your life holding wound and your life giving private parts. Hear me now. Love your heart. For this is the prize. Tony Morrison, beloved. The preacher helping the people, the community, live through the whore, that giving them the freedom by loving the physicality, bringing that physicality. They were at church, okay? Bringing that to the, the spiritual path, to the sanctuary, their lived experience as they were. Not you have to change it, or you're not nothing because you're nothing, because they say you're nothing. And so um, this, uh, there's many profound pieces in all of her novels, and this is one of them that I love, too. She has another one about love that's very beautiful, but I won't be reading that today. But I do want to say that um, if we were to simply walk past the fires of racism, sexism, and so on, because illusions of separation exist within them, we may well be walking past the widest gateways to enlightenment. We're always thinking enlightenment somewhere else, but it's through your body. It's through your life experience. And um, it is a misinterp misinterpretation to suppose that attending to the fires of our existence cannot lead us to the experience of the waters of peace. The fire can lead us. You have to go there to get to the waters of peace. We come into the to various centers, we come to school, whatever we do to, to um, help ourselves. We come in and we're like, okay, this is gonna be good. And the first thing you see is a fire. You know, something just comes up, trouble, trouble, trouble. And I think fire is usually at the door, kind of like a challenge, a test. And most people run out the door because the fire is like, oh no, I'm not going through it. I thought it was gonna be water and peace and harmony and, uh, <laughs> all those good things, you know, we're going to be there. And those things are there, but you must discover them. You must discover them as an experience, not as a thing to reach for. Oh, she's causing trouble with our peace. He's causing trouble with our peace. They're causing trouble with the peace. Ah, oh, they're breaking the harmony, you know, all of this kind of, this impossible. It's impossible for anyone to get rid of peace. It's there whether we're willing to let it in and experience it, it's, even as a country, it's there, you know? And so it's, it's important to know all of these beautiful things that we love, the absolute things like, that we love and want are right with us. Um, and, but we have to um, be willing to go through the fire so that the experience, the experience of life, the lived experience can lead us to the peace. Profundity, in fact, resides in what we see in the world. Spiritual awakening arises from our ordinary lives, ordinary lives, our everyday struggles with each other, not just our own. You know, if you're struggling, someone else is struggling, even if you think it's your own struggle. It may even erupt from the fear and rage that we tiptoe around. The challenges of race, sexuality, and gender are the very things that the spiritual path to awakening requires us to tend to as aspirants to peace. The lived experience is the gateway, sorry, uh, to freedom. 
don't give it away, don't destroy it. Uh, it's the gateway to peace and to love and to harmony. And um, there's no other way. There's no other way than through this life and through your life and um, each other's lives and the sacred um, place that we take in the world is important. And so here's the homework. It's just very, you know, how do we, let's see first, how can our everyday lives serve the healing we ultimately seek? We always think that we have to get out of our lives or go way, way deep or someplace. We have to go someplace other than where we are <laughs> to do the healing. How do we avoid reifying the wounding of systemic oppression in efforts to meet experience of peace, love, and freedom? We all experience systemic oppre uh, oppression. It's in all of our, you know, veins, you know, in this country. How do we avoid reifying the wounding of systemic oppression, efforts to meet experiences of peace, love, and freedom? Can we repurpose our human frailty and our tenderness for the benefit of awakening? It is not a weakness, it's a path. And it's a path, the tenderness, the frailties. So um, I think this is where I will stop. And when I'm um, offering, hopefully, there was some stimulation. Um, you see I have notions, and uh, <laughs> maybe you have some notions, too. Um, you know, my mother used to say, you have notions. <laughs> you have some notions. And I did. And I talked a lot up to her about life and what I was experiencing, what I wanted, how I wanted to change the world. And, you know, and then she caught, saw me becoming more and more, you know, um, um, nationalist or revolution, whatever. My head, I start wrapping my wrapping my head African cloth. I pierced all my my ears all the way up, and they are they're still there. My nose is pierced and still there, and uh, you know I wore bangles all the way up my arm, and, you know these things, and I I um, I was spouting out messages, but they weren't mine, and I knew that. But I liked the messages, but I wanted to. Um, find my own uh, on the path that would, that would resonate and would be complementary and, and in alignment. And so she, she, said, she said, they're going to kill you. That's what she was saying. They're going, I'm afraid they're going to kill you. And I was like, so I, I sat and I thought about it. She was born in 1910 in Louisiana. And so she had seen a few lynchings. I, I said, oh. She had seen the horror. And I, so I was raised with people with a lived experience in which they had to live in and be free. <coughs> so I just offering and sharing that. And uh, here is the product of it, <laughs> of their living and continuing to live, and share, and teach me and my sisters how to be and, um, and still uh, have a full life of joy and freedom. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, you want to clap? <laughs>